I am so pleased to introduce to you my friend, the Reverend Professor Dr. Mitri Raheb. Uh, he is a Palestinian Christian, and we are going to explore that for a few moments together uh, because some of you might be surprised when you hear the word Palestinian to hear it followed by Christian. Uh, but he lives uh, in Palestine on the West Bank, and he'll tell you more about that in just a moment. But Mitri, first of all, welcome to Wilshire. Thank you for what you did in the early service in Sunday school. We have lots to do today, but we're so grateful for all you do in the name of Christ, where you live in that place called the Middle East. And so tell us more about what it's like to a group of people who probably think of Palestine and Israel the Middle East, and all they think about are Jews and Arabs, uh, Muslims and Jews, and here you are. Yeah, thank you, George, first for welcoming uh, me here. It's great to be here. Uh, I felt at home from the first moment. I love the music. <laughs> I thought uh, I came to a Lutheran church when I heard the music, so. <laughs> but I, get, I, I thought maybe you wanted to uh, make me feel at home. Uh, great church. If I were in Dallas, I would join here immediately. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I think people forgot that uh, Christianity started in Palestine, right? Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Palestine, not Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Just to make sure that we know the Bible, you know. Uh, and uh, the Bible uh, did not originate in the Bible Belt. Sometimes I think, thanks God, but... <laughs> uh, but really, it's all started there. And for the last 2,000 years, there has been a Christian community living there. Uh, I know this is not like that everyone knows it. Uh, often people in this country ask me, tell us, when did your family convert to Christianity? You know, assuming maybe that we used to be heathens or Muslims who were converted to Christianity by some Baptist missionary from the Midwest or so. <laughs> uh, and actually, I was born across the street from where Jesus was born. I mean, literally across the street. <laughs> uh, so I like always to tell them, you know what? Most probably, most probably, one of my grand, 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 grandmas used to babysit for Jesus. <laughs> So we have that long history with Jesus, uh, and uh, today, unfortunately, only 1.7% of our people are Christians. Uh, the majority live abroad. They have immigrated because of the political turmoil, uh, the Israeli occupation, uh, and, you know, all uh, the oppression that we feel there. Um, but we are still there. Uh, to make sure that uh, Christianity uh, will not only survive there, but thrive. Uh, because it would be really a shame if, if Christianity will cease to exist in the land where it's all started, right? I mean, what is the Holy Land without the holy people? It's really the people who make the land holy and not the stones. So this is why we are there and continue to do our ministry. That leads us uh, beautifully into the fact that you have a a recently published book by Baylor University Press. Exactly. Uh, how about that? Uh, the Politics of Persecution, Middle Eastern Christians in an Age of Empire. There are probably still some books available uh, for you if you wish. Maybe you could see Heather afterward and she'll help you uh, to, to find one. And I'm sure that Dr. Raheb will uh, be glad to, to autograph one for you. But your claim in this book, in part, is that there is a narrative of Christian persecution, mostly by Muslims now, uh, in, in the Christian world, especially in America. Uh, and the story is much more complicated than that. Uh, and it's not that Christians are being victimized by Muslims so much as uh, this narrative of persecution tends to play into the politics of our countries and uh, also into the uh, profit uh, centers of our nations and, and groups. 
So tell us more about what it's like. Yes, you are a minority, uh, but how do Christians understand their existence there with respect to this idea of, of feeling oppressed? I mean, the settlements are closing in on uh, Palestine and on Bethlehem and the West Bank and the like. Uh, so if not persecution, what? If not persecution, it's actually resilience. That's go. the case I make in the book. Uh, because uh, the book is really, it's a book in church history. If you are interested to know the, the, the story and history of the Christians in that region called the Middle East. By the way, I don't like this Middle East because uh, this is part of the imperial packaging, because for you it doesn't make sense. It's middle of where and east of what, right? <laughs> I mean, only if you live in Europe, our region will be Middle East, and they wanted to distinguish it from the Far East, so they call it Middle East. But for you, it's n neither Middle nor East. So, uh, uh, so the, here really it's, it's the story of the of the Christians in the Arab world um, and, and the larger region there as seen as told by the native Christians. That's, I think, the importance of this book. So it's, it's, it's a perspective from inside. If you want to hear and understand what Christians there live through, uh, etc., this is really the book and not what Fox News is saying about us. Well, on that score, uh, I think the resilience requires a different strategy for how to live there. I'm going to speak in the sermon a little bit about the university that you created, uh, Dar al Kalima, and its significance in this uh, work. But you've also got a nonprofit called, get this, Bright Stars of Bethlehem. Uh, clever name, <laughs> right? And, uh, and, and tell us what that concept is. Uh, you, you're a Lutheran pastor uh, for 30 years, but now uh, more broadly, a, a, a university president and professor and, and this nonprofit. What work are you doing? What are you trying to accomplish? Uh, actually, Bright Stars of Bethlehem, you remember the story when the stars led people to Bethlehem mm -hmm. 2,000 years ago? We would like actually to see also stars leading people today also to Bethlehem. Uh, George was there uh, at our university. We had great time there, and we hope that more people from this church will come, follow the star, come to Bethlehem. But in order to do that, we need to raise really awareness and support for our mission there. Uh, because, you know, reaching out uh, uh, to, to the larger context, I mean, imagine this is the first and only university in Palestine that focuses on arts and culture. So what we teach is performing art, visual art, uh, design, architecture. Uh, I mean, what is church without music, right? I mean, you could see how powerful the music is or, or theater, etc. This is what we really want to nurture, but we cannot do it alone. Uh, we need partners in this country. And this is why uh, we created with some friends from this country, Bright Stars of Bethlehem. It's a 501c3. Uh, look it up. It's on Facebook. It's on, on, uh, uh, on Instagram. Uh, there is a, also a, a website for that. Uh, and I really hope and pray that we could create some uh, partnerships between this church and our uh, ministry. Thank you, Mitri. Now I'm going to give you this <laughs> so that you can give it to me. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, actually, I was thinking what to bring from Bethlehem uh, as a symbol of our friendship and partnership. And I thought there is no other sign uh, than the cross, because it is the cross, uh, actually. Uh, Jesus, uh, what he did on the cross, his work, his salvation is what unites us across nations, across Asians, uh, uh, oceans, uh, across languages and cultures. Uh, and I hope that this uh, cross made out of olive wood uh, will really be somewhere here uh, as a reminder uh, of our friendship. Um, thank you very much and uh, hope to see you next year in Bethlehem. Ah, wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, George. <laughs> okay.